Hi, I'm Caroline Levitt. I'm the co-founder of A Mighty Blaze, the book initiative that was begun when the pandemic started to help independent bookstores who had shuttered their doors, authors whose tours were taken away, and readers who were looking for a way to connect with writers. Today is a really special day. We have Julia Glass with us to talk about Vigil Harbor, which is one of my most favorite books of all year. It's just magnificent. Before we talk to Julia, though, I want to say a statement from a mighty blaze um, about blazing human rights we at a mighty blaze all need to work for a new ruling or constitutional amendment which can be done i urge all of you to urge your commerce people and senators to urge biden to reformulate the court as he said he was going to do blaze women's rights blaze lbgtqa rights blaze the rights of immigrants blaze the rights of those who want to be safe from guns vote in the midterms remember all those who didn't vote when it was hillary against trump it was people didn't vote because they thought it was shoo-in that she would easily win or they didn't vote because they just didn't like her personally well the result of that was trump we have a lot at stake not just abortion rights but miranda rights gay rights human rights so please write in the midterms vote in the midterms uh, you can donate to many different organizations. You can see it on our Mighty Blaze page. We also have a lot of emblems that you can look at. Oh, there it is. Blaze supports women's rights. So thank you so much. Okay, so back to Julia Glass. Julia Glass's debut, Three Junes, won the National Book Award for Fiction in 2002. The whole world over in 2006 was set in the same Bank Street Greenwich Village universe with three interwoven stories featuring several characters from Three Drunes. It's always wonderful to see old characters coming back. They live forever. Her third novel, I See You Everywhere, was published in 2008. And from where I sit, it has the best title ever. I actually wanted to use that title for one of my books and my publisher told me, no, Julia Glass used it. You cannot name your book the same thing as hers. Wait, her which title? Caroline, which title? Sorry, I was, it was to I, I see you everywhere. I see you oh. everywhere. I thought, oh, what a great title. And Elgob said, nope can't use it so it remains to you her fourth book the widow's tale in 2010 her fifth in the dark sacred light in 2014 her sixth the house among the trees in 2017 and today we're going to talk about vigil harbor which just came out vigil harbor is a remarkable work of art it really is. It's so immersive that I have not stopped thinking about both the characters and the story. It takes place a decade after the pandemic when the world is threatened with personal and political and all sorts of upheavals. And it's set in this kind of insulated uh, yacht club kind of fishing town. There's a wide variety of wonderful characters. There's Brecht, a college dropout who comes home from New York City after a terrorist attack. Austin is his stepfather, an architect, who loves this woman called Issa, the same mysterious woman that Petra, another woman who is a journalist or pretending to be a journalist, is now desperately searching for. There are mysterious visitors, including Ernesto, who seems to be an old friend but is something very different margot and mike whose spouses are carrying on with each other an illegal immigrant celestino who's trying to keep hold of his life and of course isa who may or may not have some magic about her all of these eight stories intersect in a way that's both terrifying moving funny and actually sort of brushed with hope so I, you know, what's most amazing about this novel to me is that, Julia, while you might think a post-pandemic novel would be distressing, this particular book has, it really is brushed in a kind of hope. There's a little bit of magic to it, too. And to me, it feels exactly like the novel we need now. However, I read that you've been working on this book for 10 years. Can you tell us a little bit about the inception or why you let go of it? And what brought you back to it? Well, thanks, Caroline. That was an amazing introduction, by the way. And thank you for mentioning all my books. Oh, yeah, I love them all. I had to. I had to, had to. Um, so, and, and you've given a great introduction to this book. 
So, um, you know, I like to describe myself as a writer, um, as a serial monogamist. You know, I, I work <laughs> one book at a time. I don't have like a bunch of novels lined up like planes at LaGuardia or, you know, and I, and I do occasionally write an essay, very rarely a short story. But once I'm locked into a set of characters and the characters are everything to me, it's, like, it's as if I'm married to them, you know, until publication do us part. And only when a book goes into the pipeline at the publisher do I begin to percolate. You know, another other characters begin to, to gestate with me. So what happened with this book is I started it, I'm gonna, I'm not sure exactly, but I'm around 20, 2013, maybe, 2012, 2013. And it came to me in the form of a character in a situation. And to me that I I, I had moved to this coastal community north of Boston, which some people may know, it's called Marblehead. It's oh yeah, I know Marblehead. Peninsular town. And Vigil Harbor, the town in which this novel takes place, is absolutely, you know, it, it's, it is Marblehead, at least, you know, I, I call this a an autogeographical novel. Um, <laughs> not a Roman clay about the politics <laughs> of my town. That would be fun, but that would be a very different kind of novel. So, so but, but the interest to me was, when we move from New York City to this town that's almost surrounded by water, it's not just the sailors who talk about climate and weather, you know, it's everyone. And of course, climate change had become certainly by then right. a topic. So um, what I decided that I wanted to write about an architect who designs homes right. um, meant to withstand extreme weather. But in his back, he's very, in his background is this, former relationship because Isa, the relationship he had with Isa was when he was a very young architect in New York right. decades before. And it was this passionate, intense, impulsive relationship. She was a very seductive young woman who presented herself as being from under the sea. You know, at the time I thought maybe a mermaid, as you know, now it really evolved into more that she believes herself to be or and presents herself as a selkie. Right. Right. And um, the relationship comes to a very dramatic, bad end. And it's this kind of secret tucked away in the architect's past. And he's he's happily remarried to, you mentioned Brecht, to Brecht's uh, mother. Um, right. And so, and Petra, who, whom you also mentioned, is someone who was also deeply in love with Isa. Right. And decades later, she encounters an article about Austin Kepner's work. And she has never felt that she understood what happened to Issa. And she comes to Vigil Harbor. She is the, the, she's one of the two strangers who arrive in town and disrupts things. And she exposes the secret from his past. Um, and, and so I had that as a germ. And I knew that other characters would evolve. I knew I also wanted to write about Celestino again, because actually, right. I don't know if you remember this, Caroline, but The Widower's Tale ends in Vigil right. Harbor. And Celestino is a major character then. And, and here he is decades later um, with a successful landscaping business. He's, he's married to a woman who grew up in Vigil Harbor. So he is legal for all intents and purposes. But this world that I am writing about is one in which um, not only are politics more divisive, but immigration policy is stricter. Right. And, Reproductive rights are also yes. different. Um, not that it was hard to foresee that. Um, and something else that's happened is that climate activists have become right. terrorists. Some in, in some instances, so there is there are acts of eco terrorism taking place around the country. But the people who live in this very privileged, very white, but also very liberal coastal town believe themselves to be more or less insulated from what's going on. So I had this germ of an idea, but I think that part of what happened to me, I got very stuck and I, I don't believe in, in writer's block. I just kind of tough it through and maybe I end up throwing away a lot of stuff, but I really was having a hard time working and there were no excuses other than perhaps the fact <laughs> that I was putting a toe in the, in the magical realm. And I think that that scared me a little. And I also found that at that time, I didn't feel that I could any longer write from Celestino's point of view, from the point of view 
of, of a Guatemalan immigrant. And so all of a sudden, another set of characters began to oh, sneak. That's so interesting. And I, but I, I felt like I was having an affair. I do not work on two things at once. So I had this little tiny <laughs> bottom of my desktop because I write on my desktop. And I would sit down with the architect and the mermaid and the coastal town and will myself not to sneak the cursor over to this other set of characters who who were a, so funny. a British movie star, the assistant to a world famous children's book author and a museum curator. And as you know, Caroline, those were the characters in A House Among the Trees. And finally, yep. I just dumped the architect. And <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, lurking, I've never abandoned a book. And so A House Among the Trees was published in 2017. And I thought, you know, am I going to go back to this dusty file? And, <laughs> you know, I've, I've written a good hundred pages of that book. But think about 2017 and all that was so different from when I had left that book. Right. Before. And, you know, and I remember that in June of 2017, that's when our new president uh, withdrew us from the Paris Climate Accord. Right. A year of extraordinarily severe weather uh, among 17 named store storms, 10 of which were hurricanes, were Harvey, um, Irma, and Maria, which devastated uh, the Gulf Coast and, of course, Puerto Rico. And I thought, yes, I am returning to this book. I am, I am, and although I never strive to write a political novel, my characters as contemporary people intersect with politics, you know, at every turn. Put the politics or the personal for them. Right. And so I thought, you know, I have the perfect setting to write a book in which, what if, and this is actually when I made the decision that I was going to set it. It's actually set 12 years in the future. I mean, it just so happened that way. If you do the math, it's 2034. Um, I wanted to write about a world that was very recognizable to the reader. I'm not, you know, as I like to say, dystopia is above my pay grade. So <laughs> Julia Glass novel about families and friendships and love and family secrets. Um, but I thought, what if the volume were really turned up on all the things that keep us up at night? And what if, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, what if climate activists had reached the point where in order to be heard, in order to have the urgency of their mission um, paid attention to, they resorted to violence. You know, one of the questions that I that I ask myself, and, and I mean, I'm taught, I'm addressing in the novel is: Is there a point at which violence becomes justifiable or not? When what you are striving to do, what you are striving to have taken seriously, you know, is a matter of of life, life or death for 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 our very species you know as as people you know they, they talk about you know you talk about save the planet but of course planet earth will be just fine without us the question right, that's right it's we will we will be decimated the planet will not right someone once said you know what the earth might just love to shrug us off like a dog shrugs off fleas you know so that's, right. anyway, that's that is how i that that's the story of the genesis of the book and how I abandoned it for a while and then came back and created a whole new set of characters. So that in fact, the architect isn't all that important. I mean, he's he's there. He said he's important. He is, but he's not the alpha protagonist as I had once envisioned him. I loved the title of the book because you have those two words, vigil, which implies keep being watchful, keeping a vigil, taking care, and harbor, which is like a safe harbor. So you have those two forces sort of fighting against each other. And I want to read this quote from the book, which Breck writes to his worried mom, where he says, I'm on an island, New York, New York City, whose shoreline is threatened. There's guards and cops and rangers and all kinds of uniformed people keeping an eye out for trouble. There are flood basins where there used to be basketball courts. There are stretches of summer when the temperature hits 100 degrees five days in a row, and there may loom storms, bombs, contagions, pandemics, and pandemonium. But I'm doing all right. That last line where he says, but I'm doing all right. To me, I think that is why the book impacted me so much, because it's it's sort of 
it felt to me like he was urging us to try to take care of our world, of each other, of doing what small things we can, even if it's planting a garden. I wonder if you agree with me or do you think I'm totally off the mark here? No, completely. I mean, first of all, I can't conceive of writing a book that doesn't end on a hopeful note. Okay. <laughs> not, not that I don't sometimes kill characters, <laughs> arts, you know, um, all sorts of things. My joke is that I don't know why anybody would ever ask a fiction writer for advice because we're in the business. Oh, right. We go to the bad places. That's right. <laughs> How can you tell a good story without putting people in trouble? And sometimes they get out of the trouble and sometimes not. Um, but, you know, I, I'm an optimist. Um, I'm not a denier of all the things that... Um, right. That I mean, some of which are irreversibly uh, dangerous. I... Uh, but, but like you, I mean, I have grown children and, um, I look at their place in the world and their outlook on the world. And, and Brecht is, is one character in this book through whose eyes I see this world, you know, as a young person and also Egon, who is the Marine, right. Just, right. um, who's a 30 year old aspiring actor in New York as well. Um, and I, do want to portray the possibility of the younger generations having much to be hopeful for and much to work on. I mean, because we screwed up a whole lot or we took a lot for granted. I mean, right. there are times when I know that my older son, who's in his mid twenties, just look at me and goes, you know, mom, your generation just effed it all up. You know, you just, yeah. you know. And, He's well, right. um, and, and by the way, I mean, just as a, Side recommendation. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a really great editorial in the New York Times by Ezra Klein called Your Kids Are Not Doomed. And I recommend reading that because I remember seeing that. It's a really, really good piece about the younger generation, you know, the that generation of our kids and um, the way they look at the world and the way that in some ways they are right to to worry about their very existence, but in other ways, the world isn't all, it, everything isn't worse than it used to be. I mean, what was it like to be a young person, you know, in the, in the middle of the industrial age or in, right. In, right. In, and I had a great conversation with an interviewer who, who's in her late twenties. And I said, you know, um, to every generation uh, of young people, there are things in the world that have improved and things that have gotten worse. I think that's just always the case. That's human nature. It's and the cycle. So it's 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 not just that I want to say, oh, look at the good things. I'm looking at what's dire as well, but I do feel that there is, you know, there is cause for for optimism, um, and also for adaptation. Do you think Brecht is going to be all right in ten years from now, from the end of his story in the book? Of course. Um, <laughs> you know, I, would say, I, I, I grew to feel extremely maternal about him. I did not think he would be, conversely from the architect, I did not think that Brecht would be as important a character as he ended up being. He's he has, great. He has essentially yeah. the and the last say. I mean, th this there are all told eight first-person narrators, eight characters. Right seven of whom live in Vigil Harbor, one of whom is Petra, uh, one of those outsiders. And then there's a, there's an omniscient voice that enters the story. Right, right. I was going to ask you about that. That omniscient yeah. voice was amazing. Well, well, thanks. I sort of wanted a bird's eye view of this town, too. You know, I was partly inspired by, um, I think, you know, in Empire Falls, another right. book that's about a, Russo's book, Russo's book uh, begins with a, with a kind of a bird's eye view of this town. And that's where I got the idea um, to to begin Vigil Harbor that way. And then to sort of pull out again, you know, you're very close with all these eight narrators and then you pull away and look at the world. And so the novel begins and ends that way. And yet the first voice you hear in the novel is Brecht's and to my surprise, also the last. Um, and, uh, but it was very important for me. He's a character who is in shock essentially when you meet him in the beginning, having barely survive this violent act and come home to to recover. His mother is incredibly worried about him. You get, you know, her oh, yeah. 
vision of, of what's of the scene as well. And um, so I wanted to be realistic about his prospects. Uh, but um, what I gave to him that evolved through revision was his very close relationship with language and the, the, the real consolations um, that he finds in writing poetry. And I'm not a poet, so. Oh, you know, I was going to ask you that. You know, you don't write poetry. That's so interesting. I mean, was that very, very long while I'll, I'll write a poem, but I don't send them out. I don't. So, you 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 know, you actually get some of Brecht's poems in this book. And, and if I tell you that my editor at Pantheon wears another hat, that she is the poetry editor at Pantheon, oh. you can imagine how <laughs> <laughs> and the you know the first poem there's a poem in there about where he imagines himself and this friend as a pair of workhorses working together and the first version of that poem she saw she said you know I really don't want to intrude too much but this just you you have to work on this again because if you're to make him a plausible poet and I and I did I looked at it again and again but but I was so pleased when there's a poem he writes about this house plant named, that he names Celia and she wrote beside that one now this is a poem. Thing. Oh, you have to frame that. That's hilarious. That's completely hilarious. Um, I, I want to tell people out there that to please visit bookshop.org where you can find independent bookstores. Julia especially likes the King's English in Salt Lake City or Three Lives in New York City. If you have questions, please pop them into the chat. So Julia, I want to ask you more about Issa because to me, she was this amazing character. Usually with um, magical realism, there's something really odd going on, but it's realistic. Like Alice Hoffman might have somebody who has wings under their shirt. Issa was so very much on the fence for me. We never see her pulling on a selkie, selkie skin or taking off a selkie skin. She does not have a navel, but it's explained that a lot of people surgically get it removed as a fashion statement. Um, so she sort of, throughout the book, you're always wondering, is she delusional? Was she thinks she lived under the sea as, as one of the characters thinks, or could she possibly be this miraculous creature who lives under the sea. And we never get an an a, a definitive answer, which I absolutely loved. So I wanted to know as you were writing this, did you always have a definitive answer in your mind of what she was, or did you want it to leave it open-ended or? Well, I'm gonna be coy about that because- Okay. I initially, look, I mean, I, I am not a, I'm not psychic. I've never seen a ghost. You know, I'm about as sensitive to the spirit world as a turnip. You know, I, <laughs> I, I but, um, but that doesn't mean I don't see possibilities. So I will right. initially, I felt that I was writing about a woman who, who has delusions. That's what I felt. And then I thought, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, I mean, so it's interesting that some uh, readers believe that she very much could be the creature that she claimed to be. Um, and there's like a guy who interviewed me. He's, I think he's had a radio interview, a, a radio show in, in New York for about 99 years. He's just this character. He's this <laughs> lefty who loves books and he plays Frank Sinatra and the breaks in his show. And he said, so what about that crazy woman? <laughs> <laughs> I would get involved with her. You know, and it's just, it's like, <laughs> I didn't think she was, I mean, I didn't even doubt for a minute that she was deranged, you know. <laughs> but that's so where Austin and Petra come down differently. Right. Because they have and, and there's Different a confusion between them when the secret comes out, finally, where they, where they, you know, Petra has enormous contempt for Austin for yes. his views on Issa. And, you know, and he thinks that Petra is completely deluded. But who knows? You know, no one, no one really knows. I love that. I love that. I thought that fed in, that fit in perfectly with the whole sort of feeling of the book. Um, so I want to talk about how you were able to balance and manage all these different 
voices, each narrator, narrator was so distinct and they seemed to come in at just the right, right, just at the right period. But I read that you don't outline. So how did you keep track of all these characters? Well, it was harder this time than it's been in any other novel I've written. Although, you know, I am completely incapable of writing a novel from one point of view. I, I really envy writers who can do that. I'm so, I'm, I feel as if I'm almost overly dependent on whatever world I'm writing about being seen through different sets of eyes. And it might, okay. be, it might be a duet, like, you know, I See You Everywhere, which is two grown sisters over a period of 10 years, alternating voices. Um, or, or it might be, you know, I think it's five points of view in *End the Dark Sacred Night*, and you go from one to the next to the next, and you return, you circle back to the first one at the end. So it's like a kind of a relay race. But um, in this case, when I started this book in the first place, you know, back in you know a decade ago, I actually wanted to write an entire novel in the omniscient voice. I just, I thought it's a oh, challenge. Okay, Give my students the challenge of writing, they all have to write in the omniscient voice at one point or another, just a story or, or a short piece of fiction. Um, and I thought, well, you know what, I'm gonna try to bite that off myself. <laughs> so you learned from your students, was it hard? Was it hard? I find myself slipping into the third person close. And then I thought, when I came back to the novel in 2017, I thought, you know, I really wanna go deep in all of these characters. So I'm just gonna flip the whole thing around. I'm gonna keep an omniscient narrator who will come in occasionally, but I'm gonna really go in the opposite direction and have these eight characters tell this story, which in the present moment, the present timeline of the story is only a few days during which something very dramatic happens that right. you know changes the whole culture of the community and, and puts a number of people in danger. Um, so, but figuring out the order in which I was going to introduce them was very hard. And I changed that up several times. You know, I began with the architect speaking and then I thought, no, I don't think he's likable enough. And then I had Margot, who's, who's that sort of spitfire of a, you know, right, right. Person, who, who in a way is the most fun character to be with because she's witty and she's angry. She has a voice. She has a great voice. Yeah. And um, so, but in the end, beginning with Brecht was risky because he's, because he is a character who's in shock. Um, and also because, and this was something I realized, you know, after I'd been immersed in the novel for a couple of months, you know, after I'd returned to it, was that if this is a decade or so in the future, young people, you know, teenagers and people in their 20s, that's where language evolves. And that I had to find a way to, through Brecht, show some new language, you know, and I think particularly adjectives. I mean, you and I have had young people come home as teenagers, and you've probably had this experience where what how are they using that word? Like, right. Word. <laughs> weird. That whole thing like word, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> sort of thing. That I first heard out of the mouth, I think, of my older son when he was in middle school or something. And I thought, what is he saying? So, <laughs> so you meet this character. And <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Holly. <laughs> you know, what do you mean by using this word this way? But I think it you get used to it very quickly. And um and and then of course I wanted to introduce the two spouses Mike and Margot whose whose husband and wife leave them for for each other and run off to this survivalist colony leaving their spouses you know you know absolutely gobsmacked completely humiliated in front of this yacht club right, right. right. It's, you know it's the, the scandal that that also helps set things in motion because these two people who are very different are kind of thrown together not romantically but by Right. The scandal that they unwittingly share. Um, so, so I played around. You know, it, it it almost as if they were playing cards. I kind of kept shifting them around, and then once I locked in the first four or so, I, then it it just began to unfold. There are also certain parts of the story that have to be t by certain characters. So for right. Instance, right. And, the mysterious Ernesto arrives at Celestino's house. That can't be told by anyone but Connie, Celestino's wife. 
who is right. the character through whom you see Celestino. Um, so, so some, and, and I had to sort of decide, well, in what, at what time on that Friday does he arrive in town? Because you really are moving sometimes a character, you'll, you'll get to the end of a chapter and it's say, you know, and it will say, but let's say it's two in the afternoon and the next narrator is taking it up at about three that same afternoon or something. So you're, you're moving chronologically, but you're also getting the backstories um, of all these, of all these characters, which is something I'm, I like to call myself the flashback queen. I mean, I write flashbacks within flashbacks. And if you don't like flashbacks, <laughs> I love that. I happen to love backstory. <laughs> My editor is not so fond of it, but we've we've gotten this kind of detente about that. But I love it. I want to know everything about yes. that. Right there. Yes. How did they get there? How did they? How did they get there? What were they like? What got them? It's it's sort of like because I always feel like the present triggers the past. That's an interesting. Yeah, yeah, I do. So I I was fascinated to learn that you started out as a painter. Yes. I wanted to know what lessons from painting, if any, do you carry with you for as far as writing? Is there a sense of composition that comes along or do you still paint? I don't still paint. Um, okay. You know, it's really, it's partly an issue of time and space. I did very large oil paintings here. I'll see whether I can turn this computer around. Oh, great. Oh, great. The lamp, but. Let's see, is that, does that kind of read? I don't think it does much. There's it's a, kind of dark. If I can, I'll take this over. I don't, I've never done this before, but. Oh, I'm so happy. This is a first, everybody. Go. Oh my God, I love it. So that it's a very large. That is great. So my sons grew up in a house with this naked woman on the wall. I don't think I. <laughs> Oh, whoops, Julia, you just muted yourself. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Um, All right, no. there you are. That's a wonderful right. painting. Right. There are several of those around the house, but I, I don't paint anymore. But here's the thing. I Well, first of all, I was always um, a big reader, always, always. And when I was in high school, I was on the you know the staff of the literary magazine. I wrote really embarrassing adolescent poetry. I wrote short stories. <laughs> I also drew and I was the art editor of the literary magazine. And then when I got to college and I didn't really, you know, I, I had no aspirations to be a writer, but in addition to that, the study of, of literature, and this is the mid seventies, you know, back in the Neolithic age, um, the study of, of literature was in the stranglehold of, of deconstructionism and semiotics, which to me, it, you, you know, you look at a Jane Austen novel and dissect it like a frog. You know, the author didn't even matter. It was so, and I was driven completely away from studying literature. I still read, but, and then I just, you know, I followed my visual art passion. And so through my 20s, actually that painting that I just showed you was in a group show in the Brooklyn Museum when I was in my late 20s in New York. Um, but, and then when I, realized that fiction was my first love and I started seriously writing stories again in my early 30s I I really I was very upset because I thought I've wasted all these years why didn't I realize this is what I wanted to do but the truth is you didn't know well but it's more than that the my years as a visual artist looking at the world around me have made me the writer I am I'm extremely visual and and my sense of place you know, I think the greatest pleasure I have in the crafting of a piece of fiction is putting the reader in a place, whether that is a, an old house or it's a town or it's a landscape. Mm -hmm. That to me, when I build the physical world, you know, the, that term world building is used, you know, mostly when we talk about speculative science fiction, but right. it has every bit as much to writing about real places. You have to give, you have to give the reader that world. And that I think is one of my greatest strengths as a writer. And I don't think that I would have become that writer without being a visual artist first. So you think you'll never paint again? That's a, t I, I don't know. I, one thing I also did very intricate, realistic pencil drawings. And I keep mm -hmm. thinking that that's what I'd like to do. 
I'd, I'd like to return to, to drawing. And maybe it would lead me to painting again. But as you can see, I, I, I dress in color. I know, I love your colors. You look great. You know, I'm, you, wherever you see me, I'll be, I'm always very colorful. And, and I feel like I'm my own palette. <laughs> we have a question. Ollie, can you pop it up? You stated that Vigil Harbor is highly insulated. Could you tell us about how insulation morphs and changes as one grows from a protected child into an ignorant adult? Oh, that's that is a fascinating question. Yeah, it is. Well, so so let me talk about the kind of insulated that Vigil Harbor is. Um, it is it is a a town that, um, as I said, is 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 pretty affluent, um, privileged, mostly white. Uh, one of my characters jokes about the town, and this is this is a line that my husband has about our own town, that diversity is represented by brunettes. Um, so, and yet it's a town of people who are pretty liberal minded, who, you know, give to good causes, uh, consider themselves politically aware. Um, but I would say that protected children, to go to the second part of this question, protected children do not always grow into ignorant adults. They 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 have to go out into the world to um, to discover it. And if they don't leave the insulated world that they're raised in, then they they, they may be more than ignorant. They may be deluded. And that's partly what I'm dealing with here is is the delusion that at any moment your safe world couldn't be penetrated from from the outside by forces that you have always believed live beyond your borders. Um, and it might, you know, you might even use it an, an analogy. So in my mid thirties, I was diagnosed with cancer. I'm happy to say that I'm in, and that's why I have this compression on me, but I, um, you know, that will flip your, your, everything you take for granted. Right. Honest, right. Around you when you're in your thirties is independent, and healthy and, you know, it, and then suddenly your, I mean, it's almost like literally your personal borders have been, you know, assaulted by, you know, from within. Um, I mean, that could be a metaphor for, for what happens. Um, malignancies can arrive, you know, yes. in many forms. Um, many forms. But another thing I'll say that I have been thinking about, um, when we look at how weather patterns are changing worldwide, mm -hmm just in this country, some of us feel like we kind of lucked into where we live. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be that way forever. But where I live in New England, we do not have wildfires. We might get an occasional hurricane. Mostly we get sort of the petticoats of a hurricane. We rarely, rarely get tornadoes. We don't have an issue of water supply. You know, I mean, I'm look at what's happening in the Southwest. I don't know how we can continue to move there. Um, you know, in so many, I mean, we may complain in the summer because it gets up to a hundred degrees two times a week, but it's not 130 degrees. I know. I know. So, you know, we don't, you know, I think parts of this country and most certainly parts of the world, especially where the sea level is rising are encountering, you know, existential crises. Yeah. You know, I mean, there are places like, look at a place like the Marshall Islands, that's going to be underwater. No amount of addressing climate change is probably ever going to change that. There are going to be climate refugees, in the, you know, and there already are. And, and one of the questions that I didn't tackle directly in this book, but that I think about a lot is, you know, will we step up to welcome climate refugees the way we sometimes accept you know, refu refugees from, let's say, Afghanistan or Ukraine. Right, I mean, right. We're very sensitive about who we let in. But if, but if we're that fortunate, if we've sort of, at least for the next couple of decades, won the geo, you know, the, the meteorological lottery, then how are we going to handle that? So that's a kind of, um, that's a kind of moral and philosophical question that I think we're going to be facing sooner than we realize. Yeah. Yeah. 
That sounds like another novel, actually. I'm going to let someone else tackle <laughs> Yeah. Julia, would you read a little bit? I would love to hear you read. You know, I think I'll just, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to read the first two paragraphs. Of the That's book. perfect. That's perfect. You know, we'll really give you an idea of Great. the concept of how this is very much a novel about how place exerts a real force of destiny on the people who, who live here. Okay. Let's say it's true that geography is destiny. Oh, wouldn't my dogs have to bark right now? That's all right. They're a soundtrack. <laughs> you hear me over them? They're very loud. Yes, we can hear over them. They're fine. I'll start again. Let's say it's true that geography is destiny, place entwined with person. Would living on a peninsula, promontory, headland, bluff, make you peninsular by nature? Not someone who sticks out, but someone who likes backing up to a body of water, who finds a cul-de-sac comforting, not cornering. You'd miss out on casual, unpredictable commerce with travelers merely passing through, because your town would be a place of beginnings and endings, of retreat or stasis. And after a while, you'd likely notice a sameness to your neighbors. You'd all be a bunch of proud peninsulites, privileged, but also myopic. That's how some outsiders see the people of Vigil Harbor, a town that thrusts itself into the Atlantic Ocean, all but completely enclosed by restless water, deflecting the longshore current like a crooked foot aimed straight toward the rising sun. On a map, the harbor itself resembles a long blue parcel held snug beneath a muscular arm against the Massachusetts coastline. At the big toe, two of the town's oldest roads rise toward a park with a view raised high by granite cliffs. The shoreline here is rugged with rock, nothing like the bygone aprons of silk and sand that once turned neighboring towns into summer playgrounds, much of that sand recently eroded by pummeling rains and swallowed by storms that no longer repay the ground they borrow. That's wonderful. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for doing that. I want to thank everybody who came here to listen to this interview. It's going to be Live Forever on a Mighty Blaze's YouTube station. You can watch it on the Mighty Blaze. Um, you would, it'll be a podcast later on, so you can listen to it later on. Um, I encourage all of you to visit your favorite indie bookstore and buy the book. It's just it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. And you are phenomenal, Julia. Thank you so much for coming here and speaking to us. I just... You've been one of my literary heroines for just about forever. So I'm thrilled and honored to have had the chance to speak with you. I also want to thank our brilliant genius producer, Ollie. Thank you, Ollie, for moving things along. And we'll see all of you next time. Thanks a lot. So, Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.